Mining the Word, staying true to Scripture while applying it to my everyday life. Elias Howe was an American inventor who was struggling, trying to invent a sewing machine, but he kept coming up against certain bits that just wouldn't let the project move forward. And he wrestled and wrestled with it. One night, he lay down and drift off, drifted off into salubrious somnolence. He was sleeping there, and a dream came to him. And in this dream, he was off in some kind of remote place, and the king of that area had demanded of him, you must finish this project in a certain period of time. And there was a deadline. If you don't get it done by this time, we will kill you. So he was desperately trying to figure out, how can I make this sewing machine work? And it wasn't working, and the deadline passed. And then these people were coming after him with spears, and they were about to kill him. And just before they threw the spears, he noticed something specific about those spears. In the spears, unlike anything he'd ever seen before, there were little holes near the tip. And suddenly, it occurred to him, I could do that with the needle on the sewing machine. Normally, needles have the hole at the back end, and the thread goes in there, opposite where you poke it into the cloth. But what if I move that hole up toward the tip, like the spears in my dream? And sure enough, that was the one piece he needed in order to move ahead with his project. Well, we're not looking at a sewing machine dream today, but there's a dream that made quite a difference for one of God's people. But before we jump into that, please pause with me as we pray. Lord God, thank you so much for your work in our lives. And as we reflect on this little bit of Abraham's journey, I ask that you guide us to recognize your leading in our own lives and give us strength to submit to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are in Genesis chapter 20, but before we jump into chapter 20, back up with me a few verses here at the end of chapter 19. Verse 27, And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. Then he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain, and he saw, and behold, the smoke of the land which went up like the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had dwelt. That was a terrible moment for Abraham as he looked down and he could remember, as we read in chapter 18, all that negotiating. If there were 50 or 40, 5 or 40 or 30 or 20, or what if there are only 10 people left and God would not destroy the city even if 10 righteous people were in it? But now as he looked down, he saw the clear evidence that there weren't even 10 people that were righteous in that whole city. But his primary concern was likely, what about Lot? What about my nephew? I was trying to pray on his behalf. And we noticed the end of last time that God actually answered Abram's true desire in his prayer, even if the prayer wasn't answered the way Abram specifically prayed it. The city was not spared, but Lot was spared, and anyone who truly was a righteous person, like Abram had said, Abraham had said earlier, God did not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Well, now we move to the next chapter, and things move in another direction. Verse 1. And Abraham journeyed from there to the south, and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and stayed in Gerar. Between Kadesh and Shur. In fact, remember it was on the road to Shur, where Hagar had met the angel. And so here Abraham has gone back down to kind of the general vicinity, where his wife's servant had met the angel on her journey in the wrong direction. And the angel turned her around. That's another story. Verse 2. Now Abraham said of Sarah his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Achothihi. She is my sister. And this is the kind of thing that he seemed to make as a practice. We remember seeing that way back in chapter 12. And that time it didn't end well because the king tried to take her as a wife. Verse 3, But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Indeed, you are a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she is a man's wife. Well, here we are again. 
Abraham is trying to help God. God promised him descendants and land, and we already saw back in chapter 12 when Abraham tried to help God, and he's saying, she's my sister, helping God not let Abraham die. And we see also the same kind of thing now happening happening in chapter 16. Well, let's see, I'm supposed to have descendants, and Sarah can't have them, so he grabs another person, Sarah's servant, and tries to have a child through her. And that wasn't God's plan either. And even Lot, we see Lot is also trying to help God. As here, he's trying to leave the city. God's urging him to leave Sodom. And Lot's saying, well, how about if I go to this little city? It's just a little city. Because he felt like it isn't safe where God is sending me. And each time we see that when someone tried to help God, something went wrong. Once again, something went wrong. Now, instead of Pharaoh taking Sarah in to become possibly part of his harem after ceremonies, now there's the king of Gerar, an area that eventually would become the land of Philistia. And this king, Abimelech, has taken in the wife of Abraham. When we try to help God and we do not follow God's methodology, we end up where we don't belong. Trying to do God's will without God's methodology usually is, almost always, is a bad idea. Maybe you remember the calorie pear tree that we looked at last time, and it had such beautiful blossoms, but it had this stench, that smell that was so objectionable. Well, we look at something a bit like that as we continue this story of Abram, or Abraham. Verse 4, But Abimelech had not come near her, and he said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she is my sister? And she, even she herself said, he is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocence of my hands, I have done this. And God said to him in a dream, yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Those words of God to this pagan king Give me encouragement. He said, I held you back from sinning. And that king didn't even ask to have God hold him back from sinning. And God was doing that as a way of protecting Abraham and Sarah. But just think of the power of that. If he would do that for a pagan king, he can also do that kind of thing for us. We need to claim the power of God as we wrestle with the power of the enemy. God can hold us back from sinning not unlike what we see as the last few words of the little letter from Jude. Verse 24, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forever. Amen. He's able to keep you from stumbling, to keep you from falling, and he did that for the king of Gerar. Abimelech, he can do that for us. But let's go back to Genesis 20, verse 7. Now therefore restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you, and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die, you and all who are yours. Wow, that's language like you saw coming to Adam and Eve. You know, if you eat of the fruit, you'll surely die. And now here's the message for a person who's not even following God's way. If you do this, you will surely die. Now this brought him great fear. It was much worse than that dream of the people coming at at the inventor, Mr. Howell, with spears. This time he recognizes, when I wake up, things are going in a really bad way. And in fact, they already were going in that bad way. And he may have noticed the difficulty that was coming, but we'll see that in what follows. Verse 8, So Abimelech rose early in the morning, called all his servants, and told all these things in their hearing, and the men were very much afraid. And Abimelech called Abraham and said to him, What have you done to us? How have I offended you that you have brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? You have done deeds to me that ought not to be done. Then Abimelech said to Abraham, What did you have in view that you have done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought surely the fear of God is not in this place, and they will kill me on account of my wife. What a strange irony. It's a troubling irony that I like to say, at least. Because on the one hand, we read how 
Abimelech is stopped from his next action by God, and God even said, he will pray for you. He's a prophet. You need to talk to that man or your future is bad. So here is a true prophet, but the true prophet is afraid for his life, and he isn't living a life of trust in this God who should be all-powerful. And so imagine the bewilderment in Abimelech's mind as he's thinking, that man serves a God who's so powerful, he could kill me, he can kill everyone in my nation, and yet this man's afraid that I'm going to kill him. Often things are not what they seem to be, and our fear and our living the compromises that come as a result of our fear stand as a negative testimony, a testimony that the God we serve is not able to do what is needed for our lives. And Abraham must have felt rebuked when he realized, wait a minute, I have just given testimony that my God is less powerful than this pagan king. And what a rebuke when the message came back from the king. And in fact, at some point, though not recorded, the king probably said, look, I was told by your God that you're supposed to pray for me because you're a prophet. And Moses doesn't repeat that bit of the story. He just mentions that's what was in the king's dream. Verse 12, But indeed she is truly my sister. She is the daughter of my father and not the daughter of my mother, and she became my wife. Okay, so Abraham was playing with technicalities. But notice, when he said she's my sister, though that was true, he said it in a way to give the impression she is not my wife. There are ways to make true statements that are actually conveying a false message. And we see it all the time in business and politics and in interpersonal relationships. People give true information in ways to try to make the other person believe something that's false. And that isn't in God's plan. Verse 13, it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house that I said to her, this is your kindness that you should do for me. In every place, wherever we go, say of me, he is my brother. This is the kindness that you should show me. What is the literal word that's used there? It actually isn't a normal word for kindness per se. Let me peek at the Hebrew Bible. In my Hebrew Bible, it says chasdeich. Chasdeich? That means your chesed. Remember some weeks ago, we had this whole thing about chesed, which we don't have a word exactly like this in English. Sometimes we translate it as loving kindness, etc. But chesed, there's a covenant relationship between people. And when you live inside that covenant relationship, you're following what's expected. That's the condition of chesed. So here's this chesed between Abraham and Sarah. And the chesed includes, look, we have each other's back. And the way you protect me is everywhere we go, you tell them, he's my brother. And then they'll think, oh, okay. And we'll treat you just as one big family. And if we decide to take you, at least he still gets to live. In fact, we'll reward him. Where if we thought he's your husband, we might have to kill him so we can have you. That's what Abraham was concerned about. But as he's looking at that chesed between himself and Sarah, he loses the opportunity to live in chesed between him and God. Because living in the covenant relationship with God would be to depend on God to work out some of these things that Abraham is trying to help God do. He should have been living in chesed with God instead of just chesed with Sarah. Verse 14, Then Abimelech took sheep, oxen, and male and female servants, and gave them to Abraham, and he restored Sarah his wife to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell where it pleases you. Then to Sarah he said, Behold, I have given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. What does it really say when it, he says this will vindicate you? Vindicate? Again, I'll peek at my Hebrew Bible. In my Hebrew Bible, that word or two words are kasuth enayim. What do you mean kasuth enayim? That's a covering of the eyes. That vindication or covering of the eyes, this is almost like saying, look, he's your husband. We'll 
cover those eyes that get you in trouble and we see the intense beauty and we want to take you, but you need to make sure that you belong to him. You don't belong to other people who may want you. Something like that, or perhaps it even had to do with the way that people in Arab lands often would wear the dowry as coins with little holes drilled into them over there around their faces by their eyes. But whatever the case, this is a covering of the eyes. He's saying it in a way that she recognizes you guys messed up, and I took a lot of heat for this, and I'm giving you a lot of money and all these advantages because I want your God not to be coming to deal with me. I was living according to what I thought was right. Implication. Were you? Or were you actually not living according to what your God would want you to live like? Verse 17. So Abraham prayed to God, and God healed Abimelech, his wife, and his female servants, then they bore children, for the Lord had closed up all the wombs of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. Wait a minute. Did you see the way that God healed? God healed them, but the way that they were harmed at this point was the snuffing out of any offspring in the future because there would be no more births. They were barren. And Abraham prayed, and now they could have children again. So there's a bit of time going on for them to realize, oh, now we can get pregnant again. But notice the detail. All these years that have rolled by, Abraham has been waiting for that promise for his own family. He wants his wife to have a child. They desperately want to have that child that God has promised them. But there's no pregnancy. There's no child coming except the substitute from trying to help God by using Hagar to, to give birth to a child. And so... He tries this and tries that, so many things, but then he simply prays, and the other people have that prayer answered. They get to have babies, and Abraham himself doesn't get to have a baby through Sarah. That must have really given him a strange understanding. In fact, I would call that the second irony, because in the first irony, we noted that here he's God's prophet, He's the one connected with the God who has all power, the one who created the universe. And yet he thinks, oh, the other people might kill me. I need to tell lies to save my own life. When he should have been trusting the all-powerful Lord, whose prophet he was, to save his life. That was the first irony. But now the second irony is the thing you want most badly, the thing you want most desperately. You can simply ask God and he gives it to the other people. But you can't have it yourself. Not yet. And it must have been so strange to him, almost like the Apostle Paul, who in Second Corinthians chapter 12, he's got this thing in his life that he calls a thorn in the flesh, and three times he begs God, please take it away from me. Please take it away from me. But the Lord tells him, look, my strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, you're going to have to have this still. And yet Paul is the same one who could touch people and they would be healed he could do the healing work of God on behalf of other people, and they were healed. But for his own, whatever his problem was, he could pray and ask God very specifically, take this away. And the answer was, no, it's not going away. It's staying with you. The irony. And yet, I can think of several possible reasons why God might do this for Abraham or even for other people. One of those possible reasons would be because of a lack of faith. Look, you don't have enough faith, so you're not going to get this thing that you're seeking so much. And when your faith is strong, then you will be able to have this child of promise. And so Abram, Abraham actually had enough faith for the other people to have babies, but for himself, maybe not. And in fact, sometimes we act that way. We tell people, look, God can forgive your sins. Look, you can have a life-changing experience. God can take away these things that don't belong in your life. And then we feel like, oh, I'm struggling and I can't get away from it myself. And perhaps the lack of faith was the reason for Abraham here. But another reason can be to strengthen his faith. You notice, just like Jairus didn't know, or probably didn't have enough faith that the Lord could raise his dead daughter, and yet Jesus works, he worked things out. So on the way to Jairus' house, the woman would touch him, and only touching Jesus brought her healing, and that could build Jairus' faith enough to think, well, wait a minute, maybe he could do this. In fact, he can do this. 
So sometimes God gives us the view of how he is actually at work making this happen for others in order to build our own faith. Another possibility is to change who we are because going through the struggle makes us a whole different kind of person. And missing the struggle could cause us to miss that opportunity to set down some things that don't belong or to develop the confidence Without the struggle, it's too light, too easy. But with the struggle, we remember, we lean on him. And that's kind of a fourth thing. We could be de developing that dependence, that full surrender. You cannot do this on your own. You need my power in your life. But that's the same thing that we have in our own lives that could make such a difference. So I ask that you think about this. Do you deal with those same two kinds of ironies? Because the first irony that Abraham wrestled with was the irony that here he is a prophet of the most powerful God, the Lord of the universe, and yet he's afraid that the other people are going to kill him. But don't we do that too? All kinds of ways in which we feel like I've got to engineer things in order to help God's plan come about. The second irony is the irony that other people can experience answers to prayer that I pray for them while I somehow don't see the answer for myself. And that doesn't have to mean that it's because of a lack of faith, although that could be. It could be that God is building me toward a goal. He's developing me to be a certain kind of person that he needs for a specific task in the future. So as I struggle with these ironies, I can realize, as Abraham did, I'm not where I want to be, but God is getting me ready for where I need to be. I remember when I was a child and I went to a camp meeting and they gave us a special pin that we could wear and it just had a string of letters that they told us, look, this will make people ask you questions and here's the answer for you. On that pin, it said P-B-P-G-I-N-F-W-M-Y. And at first I thought, what is that? But then they explained what it means is, please be patient. God is not finished with me yet. That was true of Abraham. That can be true for you. It is true for me at many times in my life. I recognize he's not finished with me yet. Thankfully, there's more transformation in my future. Let's pause to pray. Lord God, thank you for being there for Abraham when he needed you, even when he did not show full faith. Thank you for being there for us when we need you, even when we falter. Help us to lean on you confidently in these trying times. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for mining the word with me today, and I hope that you can live confidently and competently for the Lord during this next week and beyond. God bless you.